First, let me say thank you. Thank you to the Princeton community. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you for the work that you are doing. Thank you uh, to the students, to the alumni, and to the president of the institution. Thank you to the faculty. I have great respect uh, for Princeton, and it's a delight to have the opportunity to address uh, this community once again. Uh, It was several years ago when I had the privilege to be able to share uh, with the community, and I am excited uh, to be able to have a conversation with you on this day, and also look forward to the Q&A that we may dialogue a little bit deeper about some of the themes and issues uh, that I'll be raising today that I hope will cause us uh, to reflect, uh, to think, Uh, and maybe even to laugh at some point uh, in our conversation. So I want to begin uh, by sharing with you uh, an interesting topic, uh, a topic uh, entitled Robert Smalls and the Courage to Imagine. Robert Smalls and the Courage to Imagine. I I believe as as people of faith, uh, by lifting up this uh, often obscure, Uh, underappreciated person of faith, uh, that we may find some unique uh, way to examine our current culture and the condition of of the church and how we are to go about in terms of achieving justice in this world. Now, there are those who are stating that we are in a period of racial reckoning. I would dispute that. Because if we were truly in a period of racial reckoning, then that would mean we are wrestling. We'd be wrestling with issues of caste, in the words of Isabella Wilkerson. We would wrestle with food insecurity. We would wrestle with homelessness. We would wrestle with living wages. We would wrestle with the prison industrial complex. We would wrestle with education and we would wrestle with economic apartheid. But we are not wrestling, we are facing, but we are yet to make the decision whether we are going to fix what we are facing. So I begin by sharing a particular definition that comes from Brene Brown that I found incredibly fascinating. Uh, that is Sister Brene Brown, that great uh, doctor and scholar looking at issues of vulnerability and leadership. She says that if you want to understand courage, which is essential for leadership, essential for our development as human beings, that we must understand what courage truly is. And we have an obscure, peculiar idea of courage in American culture. Courage is a heart word. The root of the word courage is core, the Latin word uh, for heart. Now, in the earliest forms and definitions of this idea of courage, courage was not about physical acts or simply acts of sacrifice, but it was about being able to, quote, speak one's mind by telling all of one's heart. Courage was to speak one's mind by telling all of one's heart. I'm reminded of how people share uh, the prophetic tradition to speak truth to power. One could add to that, that is an act of courage because you are speaking one's mind by telling all of one's heart. I believe that this definition uh, could serve us in a beautiful way in today's culture, to become a culture, a community, a nation where we have heart speech. Uh, Not just brass political speech, but heart speech, where we could speak our heart, our whole heart, and have the vulnerability to do so. Yes, 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 it's a beautiful thing uh, to look at it from that frame point. But if I may uh, offer this definition to hang our hats on, uh, this heart speech, that in order to get to that heart speech, I must borrow from the great mystic and sage by the name of Howard Thurman, a graduate of Morehouse College, 
a native of Daytona Beach, Florida, a person who refused to be categorized by a particular discipline or walls of academia, uh, but believed that knowledge and the spirit flowed in every sector that we are all inextricably bound together as human beings. Howard Thurman states this way, that in order for one to become courageous, to have heart speech, to tell your whole heart, he, he uses this imagery. He says that in every human being, there is an inward sea. And in, on that sea, in that sea, there is an island. And on that island, there is an altar. And in front of that altar is an angel with a flaming sword. If you are to truly become authentic, to be able to speak your heart authentically, you have to find first the inward sea, not uh, the river that other people have poured into you and said you must flow down, but, but that inward sea, that space that is uniquely yours. And when you are swimming in that sea, uh, you have to struggle to get to your island. When you find your way to the island, you will see the altar. And there will be an angel with a flaming sword, not, not to harm you, but you have to get past the angel. And the only way that you can get past the angel is you have to take your fear, your failures, your vulnerabilities, place it on the altar, offer it before God, and then you can speak authentically of who you are whose you are, and speak with truth to power. It's a unique way of looking at this idea of courage, that in order to be courageous, that one must be authentic. In order to be authentic, you've got to find your inward sea. When you find the inward sea, you've got to get to the island, and you've got to place that which you have failed, and your vulnerabilities and your fears on that altar, and that is when you can truly rest in who you are and understand your call. Now, it was years ago that I had the opportunity to meet uh, the poet laureate of black joy and possibility by the, by the name of Maya Angelou. It was at the Children's Defense Fund uh, annual conference they had in July. It was in Cincinnati, Ohio. I was given the privilege to escort the poet laureate of black joy and possibility, Maya Angelou, uh, to the stage. Uh, she was having difficulty walking. I had uh, to, to take her by hand and bring her on to the stage. I was about to leave, and she grabbed my arm and said, don't you go anywhere. Uh, I want you here right next to me. And say, so here I am. I'm just excited. I'm standing next to Maya Angelou. But she said something that I will never forget. She said she believed that the greatest virtue, the virtue that activates all other virtues, is the virtue of courage. What we just talked about, what Brene Brown mentioned, uh, that courage activates everything else. Because if you have courage, then all the other virtues can come alive. She said, one cannot love unless you have the courage to love. One cannot forgive unless you have the courage to carry forgiveness to the altar. One cannot face failures and fears unless you have the courage to. And one cannot be involved with acts of justice unless you have the courage to love and the courage to pursue justice because they are tied together. I like to put it this way. I heard my father say it this way. He said that love without justice is sentimentality. Justice without love is simply legalism. But when love and justice make a decision to get married and walk down the aisle, when they jump the broom, they end up producing uh, two children, one by the name of liberation and the other by the name of transformation that we must have the courage, according to Maya Angelou, the courage to love 
uh, the courage to restore, the courage to speak truth to power, but it can only happen when we are willing to have the heart speech to tell our whole heart, but we can't do that until we find the inward sea, until we make it to that island, and you place your fears, your vulnerabilities, on that altar, and then you can discover who you truly are. I was encouraged by uh, what Maya Angelou stated. I was encouraged by um, Howard Thurman. I was encouraged by these statements by uh, Brene Brown because courage in the way in which we frame it is too male-centric and justice the way that we uh, frame it is legalized or is, uh, is the way as one scholar will put it this way that it is all about retribution and not distributive justice. We have been poisoned in many ways uh, by the marvel framing of courage. Now, I have to say, I'm a comic book fan. I've seen all the Marvel, uh, Marvel phase one. Can't wait till uh, we get to uh, phase two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, uh, to the next phases of the Marvel universe. Seen all 10 films. I used to read Marvel comic books when I was much smaller. Uh, and, and the Marvel idea of courage and heroism is always centered on the physicality or is centered around this idea of privilege. L let me break it down. Uh, you see, I'm not rich like Iron Man. I don't have royalty like Thor. I'm not endowed with scientific genius like Bruce Banner, who becomes the Hulk. I don't have superior reflexes like Black Widow. I don't have any genetic enhancements like Captain America. And I do not have an entire nation behind me like T'Challa uh, of Wakanda, better known as the Black Panther. Acts of justice, when rooted in physicality and, and privilege, is not true justice and is not connected to love and also to courage. It is Maya Angelou, it is Howard Thurman, it is Brene Brown that says that courage, and we move to this idea of love and justice, is that when we go inward, that is when we can go outward. Justice is often poisoned and perverted by the American mythos of exceptionalism and the lie of racial caste. Justice cannot breathe when constricted by the weight of these myths. And that brings me to the central part of this conversation. To talk about an obscure individual from history who's probably one of the most profound and prophetic and powerful individuals many have never heard of. A gentleman by the name of Robert Smalls. Now many listening to this conversation have never heard of Robert Smalls unless you are a studier of history, especially in South Carolina. But I wanna share with you a little bit about Robert Smalls and how he embodies this idea of courage, this heart speech. He found that inward sea and he was willing to merge love and justice together to give us a model of how we should function today, especially people of faith. Robert Smalls, who was an enslaved African in a space known as South Carolina, born, I believe it was in Beaumont, uh, Beaufort, I'm sorry, Beaufort, uh, South Carolina, and eventually was moved by his enslaver to a place that we know as Charleston. It was Robert and his wife, Hannah. I think you missed this. This is 19, I'm sorry, 1862. Robert and Hannah, a married couple an enslaved married couple made a decision as a family that they did not want their children to be raised in the antebellum South. And so through prayer and also scheming, they did something that no other people have done in the history of the United States. They plotted uh, to steal a Confederate warship and take their children along with 11 other enslaved Africans to freedom. Now the peculiar thing about racism is that racism is arrogant and ignorant at the same time. Whenever you merge arrogance and ignorance, you know you are headed down the road of disaster. And racism functions this way because in 1862, 
It was believed that people of African descent did not have the intellectual capacity to be captains of a ship, to navigate a ship, but it was people of African descent who had to clean the ship, repair the ship, uh, had to guide the ship, had to do everything in the sh on the ship, but could never receive the title of captain because based upon the racial ca caste, that would destroy the myth that had been promoted in the antebellum South. And so Robert Smalls, who worked on a ship called the Planter, uh, plotted with his wife, Hannah, to say that one night after uh, the captain and the second in command get drunk and go off uh, to some uh, particular brothel, that we will bring our friends and our family aboard and we will sail to freedom. That night came in 1862. They brought uh, their friends and family on board and Robert put on a Confederate uniform. He stood on the bow of the ship because they had been watching for several weeks, studying and memorizing everything about the ship, but also memorizing, not writing anything down, memorizing every secret Confederate code so they could leave the Charleston Harbor and hopefully pass on all of these codes to the Union forces that would change the tide of the war between the states. So Robert Small stood on the bow and they began to sail out of the harbor. They had to pass the harbor master who had to give codes, codes that would change ever so often uh, to a person that was sailing out to make sure uh, that they were friendly to the Confederate cause. The harbor master gave the signals. Robert Smalls gave the signals back. This was early, early in the morning. The sun had not yet come up, so he probably just simply saw uh, the outline of a person who was giving the signals back. The harbor master saluted Robert Smalls, and they sailed out of the harbor. Now, it would seem that this would be the end of the story because that right there was fascinating and magnificent what they were able to do, but it did not stop because the Union forces had a blockade in Charleston that any ship that was headed north was to be fired upon unless it had a white flag of surrender. And so they were traveling north. They made their way out of the Charleston Harbor when a Union ship noticed this ship, the planter, coming toward them. They did not see a white flag, so they trained their guns on the, the planter. And it was Hannah Smalls who made the statement to say that, find me a white sheet and run it up the pole so that they will know that we surrender. They found a white sheet, they ran it up the pole. But soon as they ran the white sheet up the pole, a fog came in and obscured the ability for anyone to see that they had surrendered. The Union ship began the count to shoot and destroy uh, the planter. One, two, three. Uh, before they were about to fire, uh, someone yelled out, hold it, because the sun had come out just before they pulled the trigger and they were able to see the white flag. Uh, they boarded the planter looking for uh, Confederate soldiers who had surrendered and all they found were these enslaved Africans. Robert Small steps up to the captain of the Union ship and says to him, I give this ship to Abraham Lincoln for the fight against the Confederacy. Every Union soldier, they say, was completely flabbergasted. Mouths were on the floor. They could not believe that all of these enslaved Africans had just stolen a ship. It would seem that that would be the end of the story. But once they made their way north, Robert Smalls then joined the Union Army, became the first African American to be named an officer in the military of the United States. They moved to Philadelphia. They raised money and started businesses, but then they decided as a family to move back to South Carolina. They bought uh, the plantation where they were held as slaves and allowed the mistress of the plantation to live on the land, not in the big house, small house in the back, just wanna make that clear. And they started four schools uh, for children uh, of African descent. 
started a grocery store, what we would today call a co-op, specifically for people who were food insecure in Beaufort, South Carolina. He sent, uh, Robert and Hannah sent their children to some of the finest schools in the United States. Son graduated from University of Chicago. I believe uh, the daughter uh, went to a conservatory in, in Massachusetts. I'm not sure if today that would be called uh, Juilliard, uh, but it was one of the top uh, conservatories in the nation. Uh, their youngest daughter also graduated with a master's degree because he said that there will be no lid or limitations on what they can do. But it was, they were not finished there. It was Robert Smalls who then decided to run for Congress. He ran for Congress and he won. He became one of the wealthiest people in South Carolina, but he passed legislation that would be the basis of what we now today call the public school system and what we know as early childhood education. So next time you go through your public school, just raise your hand and say, thank you, Robert. But what Robert Smalls was able to do is because he was rooted in a black spirituality. Reading his uh, biography and uh, firsthand accounts, because uh, the South had stated that you could not utter Robert Smalls' name for fear that you would be jailed or at worst, you might be executed. He was to be wiped out of the history, literally. But he was rooted in this spirituality, this black spirituality. And he was able to do what he did because, as we talked about, this idea of courage, this, this, this heart speech, speaking his whole heart. Because Robert Smalls found his inward sea, made his way to the island, and placed his fears and vulnerabilities on the altar. He did something of what Kirk Byron Jones calls holy play. He said that I will find joy and worth and dignity even though I live in a horrific antebellum moment, I can still with sacred sight witness the beauty of God in the midst of what is horrific. And this is what Robert and Hannah did. They could look at their children, playing with their children of those off times, and witness the fact that God had moved in their life, that they wanted a better life for their children. They, they talk about the laughter that they would have as a family and how that holy laughter inspired them. They had holy play. In other words, this idea that you have to have practices that allow you to see the sacred and the beautiful around you, that give you sight to see tributaries that will take you to an inward sea and ultimately to an ocean of love and justice. Sacred sight, holy play. As ministers at this moment, what holy play are we involved in? How do we see the joy, the worth, and dignity? Even in the midst of great challenges in our nation, there is a responsibility for us to have sacred sight. To be able to balance horror, but yet see hope. Pain, but still see possibility. Suffering, but still the sacred. Or as Zora Neale Hurston would say it, that even though you've been to Sorrow's kitchen and licked all the pots clean, your eyes can still watch God. Holy play, sacred sight. But the second idea that, that Robert Smalls demonstrates to us is this beautiful uh, concept that we have forgotten known as ancestral wisdom. Robert Smalls did not do this by himself. He, he was a, a great believer uh, of the fact that God was moving in his life, that there was an, uh, an interconnection between all human beings that we know as spirituality. Uh, he understood that the message and teachings of Jesus Christ were about love and about justice, about liberation. Uh, but he had something known as ancestral wisdom. He was influenced by Denmark Vesey, by Gullah culture. 
by the sounds and the stories of people in South Carolina. He, he heard about uh, the liberation movement of Nat Turner. He had heard about uh, the liberation movement in Louisiana, where 400 Africans almost overtook all of the Louisiana territory, and they had to write that out of uh, the history also. Ancestral wisdom. The wisdom that we gain from people who lived before, who give us a roadmap to how we deal with the now. There was something challenging in a culture that is so present that it cannot look back. And the words of our African ancestors to have a Sankofa moment to be able to look back at yesterday. So ancestral wisdom means that, that in this moment that we have to learn to examine and hear the sounds of those before us. Instead of holding our moment today and thinking we have the answer, we build upon what previous generations did. And we have to listen to their wisdom. The wisdom of Fannie Lou Hamer, the, the wisdom of Ella Baker, the wisdom of Bayard Rustin, the wisdom. Building on that wisdom becomes critical for building a new nation. So holy play, sacred site, this ancestral wisdom. But, but the final thing that I want to give to you, and we can have this conversation, is the fact that Robert Smalls had, had, had prophetic imagination. We have heard this over and over again by Walter Brueggemann, who speaks about the Exodus story, this, this need uh, to, uh, to see a world that is not yet, but act as if it is and break free from what is known as royal consciousness. That is what Robert and Hannah Smalls did. They had imagination. They had never stolen a warship before. They did not know what would happen to them, but they said, before I be a slave, I will be buried in my grave and go home to be with my Lord. Prophetic imagination. And that is what America needs today. People who have holy play and sacred sight. Uh, people who are willing to draw from the ancestral wisdom. And those who have prophetic imagination. Uh, I like to place it this way, if I may frame it and close out. That, that we need to, if I may borrow from the ancestral tradition and holy play, and to give prophetic imagination, I would say that we are called to have a jazz ethic of democracy. What does this mean? If we are to truly uh, have courage to imagine we must have a jazz ethic, what does that mean? Well, the beautiful thing about this music we know as jazz that was born in one of the greatest cities in the United States known as New Orleans, Louisiana, where in a place called the Congo Square on Sundays, people of African descent and those who were indigenous and German and Spanish, people of different traditions, their sounds mingled together and a new music was born that we know as jazz. Jazz is, is unique. This is the only tradition that takes instruments that are not supposed to play together and allows them to play together. The saxophone, is for the marching band. But now it plays with the piano, which was designed uh, for the classical tradition. The piano then joins with tra a trap drum set, but it does not play a simple sy syncopated beat. It plays a polyrhythm that is borrowed from Africa and indigenous traditions. Then there is a bass that should be played with a bow, but instead we play it with our hands. And you will never in a jazz band hear the saxophone say to the piano, you must sound like me, or the piano say to the drums, you must sound like me, or the drums say to the bass, you must sound like me. Everyone is given the right to solo, to share things out of their own unique cultural narrative. Everyone can bring something to the song through improvisation. In other words, we build a song together. We build a nation together, not by being forced to sound like someone else, 
but by bringing something new to the table. And I would say that if we have the holy play and sacred sight, uh, the ancestral wisdom, and dare to have prophetic imagination, and if we find that inward sea, and we make it to that island, and place our vulnerabilities and our fears on uh, that particular altar, then we can begin to play new songs that have never been played in this nation that we can literally jam together. And in the words of John Coltrane, we might witness a love supreme. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to present on this day to you, the Princeton community. May God bless you, may God keep you, and may you have the courage to imagine.